welcome to Combinations, the podcast from North Staffordshire Combined Healthcare NHS Trust. This week's episode is the second in a series of episodes we're doing, highlighting things that we're doing in the digital sphere. As you may know, North Staffordshire Combined Healthcare is proud to be an NHS digital exemplar. And we're proud and pleased for that, not just because it enables us to raise our national profile and not just because it gives us a chance to adopt digital tools and techniques for the sake of it, but because of the concrete, straightforward, simple improvements it makes, um, both to the way in which our frontline clinicians and the people who support them can do their work, but ultimately the way in which that improves the care we're able to give to our service users and the communities locally who it is our privilege to serve. Um, this week's episode, uh, we are looking at something called EPMA, which stands for Electronic Prescribing and Medicines Administration. And I'm here with a number of leaders from the Trust and project managers and frontline uh, colleagues from uh, our nurse prescribing and pharmacy teams. And so if, if, if it's all right, if I'd like, you know, I'd just like to invite each of you to introduce yourself, give you a name and tell us what you do in the Trust. Thank you. My name is David Harvey. I'm the Digital Transformation Lead for the Trust. And uh, as you mentioned, I'll be acting as the project manager for the EPMM project. I'm Adam Chambers. I'm the nurse prescribing lead for the EPMA team. Hello, I'm Bookie Adiro, and I am also this morning the interim chief exec of Combined. Hello, I'm Adrian Bond. I am a pharmacy technician for EPMA. Hello, my name is Tracy Hurd, and I'm the lead pharmacist for EPMA. Lovely, thank you very much. So, EPMA, who would like to kick us off with just explaining uh, the genesis of the project and uh, where, where the idea came from and what the original problem was that EPMA was designed to solve? I'm happy to start. Um, as some of you may know, this is something that's really close to my heart. Um, when we um, acquired our um, electronic um, patient records a few years ago, we had looked forward to EPMA to be part and parcel of that, to complete that digital transformation. Um, I'm pleased that we're now able to do that. And I'm pleased for a number of reasons. Um, clinicians um, would like to do things in a seamless way and in a safe way. Having EPMA certainly helps us to achieve that. It reduces the number of errors, it reduces the number of time, that pharmacy colleagues have to check. And most importantly, when uh, our nursing colleagues are administering medication, it gives them that confidence that they're actually delivering the dose at the right time. So I'm really, really pleased. I'm so excited that we certainly got the CPMA going. Brilliant. Thanks, Bucky. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, now, obviously, um, lots of people who listen to our podcast might have a, a, a passing interest or indeed a, a close interest in healthcare, but they might not have, have worked directly on, on the front line. So I'm interested in, in um, so you talked there about the electronic patient record and, and, and how it works and how that fits with the EPMA. Um, could could, um, um, could you, uh, our colleagues from our nurse prescribing explain um, what is the actual physical process that, that, uh, that would happen before EPMA and, and what, how it might happen afterwards? Oh, currently, they use paper prescription charts. Uh, so when a patient arrives to the ward, uh, the ward staff would take a record of any, any medications that are brought to the ward with them and like, doing a medication history. And then the, the, the doctor comes to the ward, does the admission process and then prescribes anything that's required for ongoing treatment during the current inpatient stay. The difference with EPMA is that the meds clerking element will be electronic. So any, any qualified member of staff could do that because that is just taking the medication history, not prescribing as, as such. And then a prescriber would then come along to prescribe the inpatient as you would on a paper chart, but it would just be on an electronic system. Right, so I guess what, what we're looking at, I think you were saying there, Bucky, that this sort of completes, completes the end-to-end -end process, if you like, because it, it sounds, this thing as a layperson, that you know, on the one hand you'd have the benefits of an electronic patient record, mm -hmm. but then a, a crucial part of it, you'd still be going back to, to yeah. pen and paper. Which, yeah, currently that is what that's, that's what's happening currently. Yeah, and that's what we are, so we're going to move to a, a fully electronic yeah. patient, a, a fully electronic approach. Yeah. Yeah. And colleagues from, from them, 
the other side of the issue, like the, the prescribing side, again, how, what would be the, the, the current process and, and what's the idea of how, how this will, will benefit? So, the, I mean, the current process, like Adam has said, is on paper, handwriting on paper. Um, and that comes with all sorts of problems, such as the spelling errors, you know, incomplete chart, chart not completely filled in just because fields have been missed. Um, handwriting that's difficult to read. <laughs> areas that have been crossed out next to areas that are still active, so it's hard to see what needs to be given. Um, so there are lots of areas, yeah, you know, lots of areas at the moment where things have been missed, medications not given where they should have been, just because the charts themselves are too difficult to decipher. So the electronic process hopefully will make it so it's very clear to see exactly what needs to be given and exactly when. And if things get crossed off the chart, they're still visible, so you still a complete record of what the patients had, but they're at the bottom and they're in a different colour, so you can't mistake it for something that should be given. Um, yes, and, and, and I think it's probably worth saying at this point, isn't it, that even though we're describing things like uh, maybe difficult to read handwriting or yeah. something like that, um, we're not saying that the care that has been provided up until now has in any way been unsafe or, no, or something like that. It's more it's more about the sort of the sort of bureaucracy and the headache and the, yes, and the yeah. complications of trying yes, to do it, isn't yeah. it? And there's a lot of time spent off the ward for, for clinicians and nursing staff coming back and forth to pharmacy, bringing the chart to order medications, but also to change things on the prescription chart. They'll need the, the current paper charts need to be rewritten every eight weeks because they expire or they run out of space. So you'll need to rewrite an entire chart just because you've run out of space to prescribe one item. So it's all that duplication of effort that staff are currently making that can be completely eliminated with an electronic chart. Wow, how, how long would it take? Say, say I've got to rewrite the chart and because I've passed by eight weeks. How long would it take to write, to write a chart? So it depends on how much medication the patient is on. Yes. And typically our patients are more than are on more than one um, medication. So for example, um, a typical older person would have at least five different um, uh, types of medication they're on. So if you imagine that you've got to rewrite that as well as we haven't spoken about the as required medication, which in itself could be another three. So you're talking all in all, eight lots where you've got to write the dose, check the time, and then sign each one. So you can imagine how, well, in terms of efficiency, certainly that, that would um, rapidly improve with EPMA. And as uh, Tracy said, you know, some of us have, not me personally, I've been complimented about my writing, most typical <laughs> doctor's writing. Um, but you can imagine that some handwriting is tip, just difficult to decipher. Um, so I, I'm honestly just, just so excited. We haven't even spoken about leave, leave medication because mm -hmm. sometimes our patients need to go on leave out of the hospital and then we have to handwrite that leave medication again. So again, imagine roughly up to 10 different lots of medication that you've got to individually handwrite and then take to pharmacy as uh, Tracy's described and then return <laughs> with the drug. So you could have um, on one ward, for example, three discharges as, as well as three leave medicines. You can begin to imagine what that can be like for all colleagues on the ward or clinicians. So Good gracious. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and again, another thing that, that people might might not um, uh, might not appreciate, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but when we're talking about you know these things need to be changed every eight weeks now. Now, people might think, well, that's not an awful lot of pain. That's not a typical patient, is it? You know, normally you know you hurt your leg or something and uh, and go to A and E and you sort it around. But we we actually have got you know our patient cohorts. We have a lot of people who are here for you know a considerable period of time. So so this is this is. This would go around a number of times, wouldn't yeah. it, with, with, with the same the same patient? Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And as well as that, sorry, um, there's the environmental issue of all the paper that we're using, obviously, for the prescription charts, 
leave description, discharge description, so we will we won't be using that much paper, which is obviously good for the environment. Um, another another main issue in pharmacy, Trace has alluded to it, but the amount of time we spend looking for prescription charts, I would say at least three or four phone calls per day on an average day we get from wards saying have you got such and such prescription chart um, and then obviously we have to look around if we can't find it then that means they have got to have another look on the ward with with electronic prescribing there'll be none of that because the chart will be on the screen they'll be there so it'll save a lot of time in pharmacy as well um, and that's another another point as well not just the time it takes to look for the charts if they are missing but currently with a paper chart, only one person can look at it at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a prescriber that's trying to look at the chart to prescribe something and review the patient at the same time as the pharmacist trying to review the charts to do their checks and a nurse trying to look at the chart to administer some medication, it creates some delay because obviously only one person can use it at a time. But with an electronic chart, those processes will be able to go ahead concurrently so it'll save a lot of time for staff members, all groups of staff members. That's an absolutely important um, <laughs> key bit of information that even I've forgotten about. Yeah. And, and an example is we're having a discussion, an MDT, a multidisciplinary team meeting about a particular patient. And there are a number of times you request a chart and then we hear over the charts in pharmacy. <laughs> so you can't make that decision there and then because you need the charts to make that decision. Yeah. So absolutely yeah. agree with you, Trace. And also even within the MDT room itself, even if the chart's available, only one person can look absolutely. at it. And some men now with you know modern technology, some members of the MDT might be working from home or not physically in the room, attending mm -hmm. the MDT via Teams. They'd also be able to look at the chart on their own computer screens mm -hmm. and give full input to the MDT. That's really key as well because of the uh, kind of um, innovation with video consultation and virtual working. So you can, from wherever you are, so we've got... Um, the community teams also joining into the MDT and as you say, you know, it's just great to be able to have all the information to hand to enable each member of the team to contribute to, to that conversation. Yes, and, and I would imagine if, if, you know, if there are any questions, if there are any clarifications or anything needed, the, the speed at which you can have that in real time, just talking and checking as opposed to a, a piece of paper going from one place to another place to another place is it's huge. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Well, regular listeners of this podcast will know that, that um, when we did the, the, the previous um, uh, digital episode, when we were talking about digital aspirants, we were talking about community aid. Um, one of the phrases I just used there was this just seems like a complete no brainer. Yeah. Says to why would you not? So, so, so um, okay, so, so I, I, we can see the benefits and we can see all that sort of stuff. Um, the, um, so, out of, out of all of the range of things that we could do as digital exemplars and we've got a number of ways in which um where did the genesis of this specific idea come from and, um, and why was this this put into the, the first the first cohort do we, do we know that it's something that was piloted at the trust a number of years ago on one of our wards wasn't it so it's something that we've been thinking of doing for a number of years it's just having that push to get it out there onto the wards yeah and also uh, previous Previously, when we, we, we rolled it out to, to the one pilot board, the, the actual software wasn't as we needed it. Um, um, so, obviously, now it's been developed and, and there's been a lot of fixes, and, and Daedalus have worked with us um, to get more to how we want it and more how you know it would work for us. Um, so, yeah, this time around, I'm, I'm a lot more confident in the software than I was previously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously you mentioned a the pilot there, and it's obviously one of, the, one of the good things about a pilot is not only do we demonstrate what we know will work, but we, you know, we learn things along the way about how we could tweak or anything. Was, was there anything that we learned um, that, uh, that as part of the pilot that, that changed our initial views of how this might work and, and, and refined how we could approach it? I don't think anything changed in that respect. I think, you know, back then, if, if, it, if the system worked as it does now, then I think we would have got a lot further with it and um, there were certain showstoppers that, that stopped us rolling out further. 
Uh, part of that was the leave and discharge prescribing, um, which we've now we've got a workaround and it, it it works as we want it to work. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say there was any issues within the trust that stopped it previously. It was just more. The software. It was about the development of that technology, yeah. wasn't it? So yeah. the development of the technology has come on in such leaps and bounds that it's now more useful to us as a trust and more feasible yeah. to use yeah. and easier to use. And Adam, if, if my memory serves me correctly, I think we were one of a few uh, mental health trusts that uh, started to use the Lorenzo uh, system, which perhaps was uh, instrumental in kind of ensuring that we tested it, that it suits um, how we work in mental health. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's, that's one of the examples of where the difference between a sort of traditional way, if you like, or a slightly rigid sort of way of doing it, and, and an exemplar way of doing it, and it's just accepting. Look, there's nothing wrong with learning things along the, along the way. There's nothing wrong with a, an, an initial piece of technology, you know, being introduced into a real world scenario, and then going, you know, we need to make some tweaks here before we before we roll this out more generally. That's that's just it seems quite sensible. It's sort of co-production, if you like. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, one so. One thing I was just struck by there when, when you were talking about um, obviously more people can have access to the central record and everything else. Well, obviously, one of the things that, that, um, that people are aware of when, when we talk about anything to do with digital and anything to do with records and everything like that, and, and, uh, the, uh, people get worried about security of the information and, 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 and you know, at, at sharing and privacy and all that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, I was wondering if you'd, you'd um, like to a little bit about the, the how we're ensuring the, the, the information governance, and sharing and privacy uh, concerns are, are allayed. So uh, the good news is this is all being developed alongside the clinical system provider. So it's all integrated and it's all under the same hood, if you like. It's not another product that we're bringing in with a different supplier. So this is part of Lorenzo, uh, in essence. Uh, alongside that, we work really closely with IG, and if there's any change in the way we handle data, that's reviewed and goes through appropriate sign-off. Um, and, and IG is in, in information government. Information sector. government, yeah. sorry, yes, that's right. And the other thing we have, if there's any changes in, in policies and procedures, they are taken by the team here and to the clinical effectiveness group to be signed off. And so there's a few controls in place, um, and we don't... Part of the project management project, uh, process for me with this is that we don't just bound along and we, we won't just run and go live without any controls. So part of my job in this project is to ensure that there are gateways where everybody in the project group signs off that they're happy to go live and that might be that people have been trained appropriately, that policies have been signed off and that you know, general awareness is, is, is good enough that we can safely go live. Right. And, 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 you know, the, the, the uh, group of people around this table is a, a big a demonstration that is clinically led. If this, this, you know, there's a very, very strong um, input and, and, and checking with, with the actual clinicians themselves who are, who are, who are providing, mm -hmm. providing the care, as, as well as the technology, as well as the project management, as, as, as well as the, the, the product development. So, Absolutely. I mean, throughout the whole process, we've been engaging with other clinicians, we've been holding workshops. Um, so, yeah, throughout every stage, we, we're making sure that we're including the people that are going to ultimately be using it. Yeah. In terms of information security, we can probably say that with the electronic system, it's going to be more secure than the current yeah. paper yeah. system because it's through Lorenzo. So, you can only access it through your own smart card. And only the clinicians involved in the patient's care can then look at the record. And if anyone else accesses it, it's audited. Mm. Whereas the paper chart, you know, they can be lost. Anyone, you don't never don't know who's looked at it. Someone can look over someone's shoulder and read it. So, you know, there is that increased security of information with the electronic system as well. Yeah, and as Tracy said, the whole system is fully auditable. So everything that you do in the system is stored and it can be audited at any time. So, so apart from saving money and being more aligned with what clinics, uh, clinicians want, and being more efficient, and being more secure, and being implemented in a sensible way, 
it's really not done very much, has it? <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder where you were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, old, the old ones are the best. The old ones are the best. <laughs> The point about this book is, is, is I, and you know, people who have heard you before and also have seen some of the things we do around our AGM and, and some of our some of our staff awards, though, that the, the 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 sensible and pragmatic good implementation of research and innovation ideas is something that is so dear to your heart. This must just be music to your ears. Oh, like I said right on the start, <laughs> I I don't know whether you can see that I'm so excited about it. It's, I can hardly contain myself, and you've 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 got it in one. This is the future. I'm I'm all for innovation, testing, checking, and and doing things differently in a way that you know encapsulates all those things that you said right at the start. It's efficient. It's safe. It delivers great care, patient satisfaction, clinician satisfaction. Yes. <laughs> So I guess I guess the only question now, never ever putting any pressure on a project manager, obviously, is uh, so to to uh, to ask a healer's question. So when are we getting this then? <laughs> I could be uh, suitably vague and say early next year. Um, in, in honesty, we we are aiming for a phased go live, which means we'll be we'll be tackling one word per week. Um, just so we can offer support and, and make sure that training is easier to achieve in a bit more of a targeted way. Um, currently, we're looking at the end of January 2022, um, but that is based on a few caveats there. It's have we met the training threshold to safely go live? Is the infrastructure in place? So that you know there could be some slippage there by two to four weeks potentially, but the end of July, the end of January, sorry. So end of January. End of January, end of January is our is our is our aim. And we'll work into that with, with suitable flexibility. And um, so as a project manager, as, as anybody uh, around this table who's been involved in, in projects before will know. Uh, there tends to be a natural life cycle isn't on projects that everybody is really excited at the start when you write a business case and they're particularly excited when you get the money and then there's a bit when you implement and then sometimes the thing that, 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 that doesn't get as much attention is see okay what about the lessons learned did we achieve what we wanted to do how do we go so I'm wondering that whether or not uh, it might be an idea to set ourselves a goal and, and probably got this podcast that we will come back in maybe six nine months time after it's been running in, in uh, yeah, come back and say, yeah, has it, has it achieved what you wanted it to? And, 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 um, and have we made any further changes or have we learned any further lessons? There's some breaking news on that this week. This week we've sent out um, questionnaires to all different staff groups to sort of seek their opinion on the processes that they do, how long it takes them and how satisfied they are with those processes this week. So staff already have those surveys to fill in. Um, we're going to collect data now before we've started the process and then we'll also repeat that process after we've implemented the system to see what the difference of opinion is for staff, whether Brilliant. they think things are quicker, more efficient, more safe. Great. So, so, we're, so we're doing some sort of you know, like qualitative assessment of what yes. we're doing, mm-hmm. as well as the quantitative, as well as the, you know, the things that we can track and with the, you know, with the, the time and motion approach. Yes. That's just fantastic. Well, well, listen, look, thank you very, very much for, for taking the time to come together. The, um, it, you know, as, as uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some other aspects of digital exemplars. I, I know, again, just sitting, listening to this, what I'm hearing here, the same, it's the same things we heard in the first thing with the community aid, which was people saying, it saves me time, it saves me, it, it saves me effort, it's, uh, it gives a better quality of service. It, it's just fantastic. It's just great. So, so thank you very much, um, and uh, we look forward to coming back, and uh, either at the end of June or July, or <laughs> January, or March, or whatever the project manager tells us we can, and, and, and coming back and looking at the success. So, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.